This panel is um, breaking glass ceilings, not chairs, um, <laughs> and the securities law. But don't worry about it. <laughs> um, Just don't sit in it. Uh, we, and, and please, not legs or limbs or anything either. Um, and so what we, what we decided to do was talk, there are two themes here. One is breaking glass ceilings. Uh, and the other is, is there or isn't there anything about the securities law field which uh, actually makes that easier or not, or, um, or easier in some instances, not in others. Uh, and we are uh, unfettered by actual data. Uh, so we, we are, we're going to speculate and share experience uh, along the way, uh, which will be lots of fun. Uh, the other thing I think is worth noting, uh, tearing a page from one of the sessions yesterday, uh, I added it up. Uh, we have over, we have close to 160 years post-graduation. Uh, which is on average 30 plus for each of us. Some of us have skewed that number more than others. Um, but the point, uh, if there is a point, is that breaking ceilings takes a while. Uh, I mean, if you're gonna be in, entrepreneurs can bust through everything in 15 minutes. Uh, but lawyers and people like us, a little risk averse, it takes a while uh, before you're close to the ceiling to see whether you can crack it or break it. So uh, patience is a virtue in all things, including this. Um, I am joined today by a terrific panel. Um, and I think if we thought about it, it's great diverse experience. I'm Linda Thompson, by the way. Uh, I should have said that. Um, and uh, just briefly, uh, I, I, if you want to talk about a revolving door, that would be me. Uh, I've been in and out of government a, a few times and in private practice one more time. So I've done five revolutions. Um, so in order of graduation, but, but what we do have uh, are experiences. We have people who have been in the securities field, in the public sector, their entire career. We have two people who've done that. Uh, one of the two, we'll go through, uh, has done it in one agency, multiple jobs. Another, uh, different agencies, uh, different experiences. Then there, uh, at least one of us has been in the private sector virtually her entire career. Uh, and then two of us have been revolvers, but we have been different kinds of revolvers, where we are above and below the V. So uh, I'm above the V when I'm in the government and below the V when I'm in the private sector, and Joy is uh, below the V when she's in the public <laughs> sector and above when she's in the private sector. So that's, that's a pretty diverse crowd. So just briefly, Elise Walter, who uh, has, has been in the securities business for a very long time, uh, multiple agencies including the SEC, the CFTC, and FINRA and its predecessors, which I would describe as quasi-public or quasi-public interest, um, and most recently served as both commissioner and chair of the SEC before her well-deserved, and we have yet to see how successful retirement um, <laughs> within, the, I don't know if it counts yet, because it's only been a couple of, uh, was it months yet? Mm -mm. No, weeks. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and I asked everyone to, to tell me about a first uh, in a minute, everyone's going to talk about their careers and talk about moments when they thought they were breaking the ceiling or in retrospect thought they were. Uh, and she immediately noted that despite the fact that I know she was in the first uh, graduating class from Yale College, uh, she believes herself to be the first commissioner and chair who's ever played the accordion. <laughs> um, so moving down, and again, this is in graduation order, uh, Elaine Mandelbaum, is Managing Director and Deputy uh, General Counsel of Citigroup Global Markets. Markets is responsible for all of their regulatory and enforcement work uh, and uh, has been doing that for some time. She took the traditional or the semi-traditional route of being in big law, an expression that didn't exist when I went to law school, um, and then moving in-house uh, and now has a monumental task with a very small staff, I can um, speak from a knowledge on that. And she, her first, uh, more sublime, she's first generation American born here, so we're delighted to have Elaine join us. Uh, Joy Cruz is, um, 
She, like me, is the revolver. Uh, she is a partner at Leaf Cabrasser, Hyman, and Bernstein in, where? It's in California. San Francisco. San Francisco, uh, where she represents plaintiffs uh, in securities actions. Uh, before that, she was a public defender. I am hoping Joy will uh, explain that transition because it's not immediately apparent to me uh, how you move from, say, defending someone who distributes cocaine uh, <laughs> to um, representing those who have claims against uh, financial institutions and connections with their securities transactions. Her first, another one that's sublime, first in her family to go to college. Uh, Felisa Kung is, uh, she has been at the SEC virtually all her career uh, and has had many positions within the commission working for commissioners, uh, a commissioner uh, working in the division in corporation finance uh, with a great international uh, perspective and currently has the uh, colossal task of heading up rulemaking in the division of corporation finance and for those of you who have been paying attention Dodd-Frank has increased the burden on that office somewhat dramatically uh, some of us keep count of uh, the rulemakings etc and it is really quite extraordinary and she is um, still smiling. Uh, and her first um, is somewhere in between. She was the first um, editor-in-chief of the newspaper that, was, that she helped found at her high school, which was the first high school in Missouri to be air conditioned, or, or the first <laughs> in town. Um, and I think it was, um, uh, it was an incubator that we were cool enough to actually think great thoughts. So uh, that is the crowd. Um, and what I thought we'd do is start, have everyone please give a thumbnail of your journey through this, uh, through this profession with two focuses. One, those moments, or foci, excuse me, those moments when you thought, or in retrospect think, you were breaking slash cracking the ceiling. Uh, and then, uh, because we don't do it enough, those things that you are, name one thing you're really proud of accomplishing in the course of that career. So at least we're kicking it over to you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, but let, me, let me start by saying that in, in my five years on the SEC as a commissioner, uh, I was asked many, many times, what's the career path for becoming an SEC commissioner? And uh, as you'll learn as I go through my history, my answer is always the same. It's, it's called serendipity. I never thought this was a field I wanted to be in. I did not take securities law in law school. Uh, I did take corporation finance, and I do want to applaud Victor, uh, applaud Victor Brudney for convincing me it was not a terrible thing to go into this field when the opportunity opened for me. I thought I wanted to be a civil rights litigator. Uh, but never having visited the civil rights uh, d division, I was wary of taking the job offer that I had, and so I went back to the law firm I had clerked for the summer before in Washington and um, thought I was going to be a trial court litigator. And it was a very interesting firm because it had a sort of national and local practice. Uh, but after about a year, I decided that being a trial court litigator was not for someone as um, t stereotypically neurotic as I am, uh, that I would drive myself into an early grave or at least until uh, into a bottle of vodka. So it was just not, <laughs> it, was, it was not a, a, a real keen idea. So I kind of looked around at the firm because I like the firm. And there was an opening in the corporate and securities department and I took that position. And I liked that practice a lot. And about two years after that, I was three years out of law school, I woke up one morning and thought to myself, but you wanted to do public service for a while. And if you don't do it soon, you may never do it, so you really ought to give it a try. So I kind of tried to figure out what that meant. And luckily, again, serendipitously, I had a friend down the hall, a male friend, who had a very close friend at the SEC and said, let me send your resume to him. And it was approaching the end of the government fiscal year, and anybody who's been in the government knows the end of the fiscal year is when you get the bums rush to hire, uh, to be hired. And I very quickly had an offer that I took from the general counsel's office and went in uh, against my free will with a three-year commitment, which I thought was outrageous, outrageous. 
uh, and I only stayed 17 years. <laughs> so um, it, uh, it was a phenomenal opportunity and I loved it. Uh, I continue to think uh, that not only is public service wonderful because it in fact is public service, and, uh, and I really do feel strongly about protecting investors, but also because working in the government means you get to have an impact on making policy, uh, as opposed to teaching people and guiding people as to how to comply with the law. Uh, and you also have to look forward many, many years in order to try to determine that what you're doing today uh, it, it does not do any harm to long-term plans. In that sense, I think, similar to being an inside a general counsel. And you have to put things in a larger context. So I spent 17 years at the SEC in the general counsel's office, half, the first half, doing first a variety of things in appellate litigation, then advisory and legislative work, and the second half of my initial stint at the SEC uh, in Corp Fin, uh, mostly as, uh, as the deputy director. Um, I, I, I want to back up there and say it is very clear to me now, although it wasn't so clear to me then, that when I got out of law school in 1974 and I knew in some ways it was a seminal moment in time, it really was a turning point with respect to the women's movement, and I was one of the first people I knew who didn't change my name when I got married, but I didn't think that much about it professionally. Uh, and I, I have to say, I was lucky. It's not that I didn't get some of what one would expect. The guys in our litigation practice called me and my colleague, who also went, uh, was in my class at Harvard, lawyerettes. But they were helpful, they were mentors, and so a little lawyerette really didn't do too much harm. It was true that unlike our male colleagues, when we called the local courts, which had a lot of unwritten rules that they wouldn't tell anybody about, they would just reject your filing when you made it, they would talk to both of us because they thought we were secretaries who were going to get beaten upon by our bosses. So it was a, a little bit turnaround it, it is fair play. I was told early in my tenure as a securities lawyer by a senior partner that the bad news was that one of our clients thought I was a paralegal, but the good news was that he loved me and he, the senior partner, had straightened him out and the client would never make that mistake again. So there were moments, but overall I was really terribly lucky and I will say that when I got to the government, I saw what I didn't see in the private sector, which is women in senior positions. And uh, at the time, that largely was a matter of numbers. We've now tracked the uh, class of 1953, uh, which, uh, which coincidentally uh, was when I was three years old, so all of this has happened in my lifetime, uh, had a uh, you know, couple handfuls of women. By the time my class graduated in 1974, the class was, oh my god, 9% women. There weren't that many female lawyers out there. Harvard was a little behind, but it wasn't that far behind. So it wasn't really not to be, it was to be expected that you would feel a little bit lonely uh, and a little bit challenged by that. But in the government, there actually were people who had cracked that barrier. Now, as Linda and I were talking about before, it was in more in some divisions of the SEC than in others. And we used to joke about the girls' divisions, which weren't all girls, but, and the boys' divisions, which pretty much were all boys, and it took longer for them to crack that barrier. Uh, so I will say that um, I actually um, felt that I had some mentors, and was one of the reasons I really so much liked working for the government is dealing with people who had paved the pathway for me. And it also made me feel that I had an obligation to pave the pathway for others. So I will leave it at that, and oh, if you want to talk, what, what, you want what, to? Where'd you crack the ceiling and what are you proud of? Okay, <laughs> well, um, I was, um, uh, where did I crack the ceiling? Um, I don't know where I really cracked the ceiling because I didn't do anything that someone hadn't done, uh, hadn't done before me. I will say that the last three chairs, including the current one of the SEC, are women. And there had never been, although there had been an acting chair before, who, a couple of them who were women, there had never been a chair. And um, 
we had, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Congressman Cicilline from Rhode Island, who was the first openly gay mayor of Providence, great guy. And he came to speak to us during Pride Month a few months ago, and he looked at all these pictures on the wall of all of the chairs of the SEC, and he said, oh my God, no diversity here. I said, well, look at the other wall. At least we're creeping in. <laughs> it's kind of like looking down the hall as we walk into the hall. Uh, it, it, it is. Um, and uh, nor was I the first female general counsel of the CFTC, but I was the second. And I do feel that there are a number of us who broke the barrier of making younger women feel comfortable and feel that they had role models, that they had mentored, although nothing scared me more than finding out from a number of women that they looked to me as a role model when I thought all those years I was barely hanging on. But at least I did. So I will leave it at that. Oh, all right. So Elaine, let's, let's see. for you, a brief outline and then your your ceiling cracks and uh, your proud moments. Please. Sure. So um, I'm class of 83. We're sitting in class order. Um, and back then, the number, the percentage of women in the class had climbed all the way to 28% women. And my husband is class of 83 from NYU, where it was apparently 50% women. So um, Harvard was trailing at that point in time. And law firms, um, as you might imagine, um, were there. I'd say probably 30 or 40 percent of the entering class at Paul Weiss, where I started, which is a great firm. Both law firms I worked at are great firms, um, were women, um, but there weren't that many partners. And when I was a summer associate, there was one or two women partners, and there was a woman corporate partner who was head of the summer associate program. And I hadn't worked with her because I was a litigator. Um, but when she was making my offer at the end of the summer, she kind of looked me up and down because I had kind of wild, crazy hair. and. Um, I was a little countercultural back then, and she said, I guess women of all kinds can be successful today as she sat there with her little bow tie. <laughs> that was a dreadful stage in the 80s. Just so, just yes, it was. And so then I went to work at Paul Weiss, which was, I worked very hard. I learned a lot. It was a great place to work. Um, but I worked for one male partner, for example, and I didn't really get to um, experience all that the men were experiencing because generally the time that he would make for men, he'd say, come pee with me. And people would have to <laughs> walk down the hallway, go into the bathroom. And that I didn't get at all from him. And as a matter of fact, what I did get from him is every once in a while he'd say, Elaine, please don't curse. I know it's sexist, but it really drives me crazy when women curse. So. I wouldn't say that I was hampered by being a woman, but it was a very intense experience. And you were entering a boys club. Um, and it was difficult. You felt knocked around. Um, and there were not women role models in the way. But I take it back. Colleen McMahon, who, um, who's a federal judge in uh, Southern District of New York, who is fabulous, made partner after I got there. And she was a great role model. But they were few and far between. So then I went to Jones Day, which again is a wonderful law firm. But I worked a lot with one partner, and I knew that I was going to have a problem with him early on. Um, and then a year into working with him, uh, he said, you know, Elaine, what you should do when you go for those depositions in Minnesota, you know, this is those depositions that that guy Rob took were great. And he went through exactly why the set of depositions that one of my male colleagues had taken were so great. And I listened, and I said, thank you. I took those depositions. I'm glad that you thought they were great. Too bad you don't remember that they were me. Uh, so uh, I was looking for a new challenge. I was looking for something new to do. And I will tell you the truth. I just lucked into a position that was good at the time I took it and became even better in a short period of time. Uh, and so I went to work at Smith Barney um, in 1997 on September 3rd, I think it was. Within And my role there was to be a litigator, and I was brought in because I had worked at outside law firms, and I was going to manage um, outside counsel. Um, and so I knew how to handle outside lawyers because I was one. Um, but within three weeks, Smith Barney, a relatively small, well-known, but relatively small broker-dealer, which um, was focused on retail, and I was brought in to handle more institutional work, merged with Solomon Brothers became way more interesting almost immediately. And then lo and behold, six months later, um, merged with Citigroup, City Core at the time, and became Citigroup. And so my job, just by virtue of me being in the seat, became more complex, more interesting, um, more diverse. 
And I was hired by a man, and my boss for many years was a man, who liked to hire women. And the reason he liked to hire women was because he felt that he was going to get the best quality lawyer for a woman who wanted to go in-house. Because there was a myth, um, maybe it wasn't a myth back then, but it's a myth now, that when you go in-house, it's an easier life. It's a way to step back. Um, and the type of women who were looking for more control over their lives, uh, the type of uh, lawyer that was working, looking for more control over their lives were generally women who still wanted to work and still wanted to have a challenging job. And he thought he could just get a better lawyer um, if he was hiring women. And so I became a litigator. Um, I was handling a broad range of institutional class actions for the investment bank and sales and trading disputes, and it was fascinating. And then um, this regulatory enforcement position opened up. And it reported to my boss at the time also. Uh, and I was involved for a year. I remember, well, when they kind of moved the last general counsel of regulatory enforcement out of his position, I said to my boss very innocently, if you need some help because I know how busy you are, I'm happy to help out. And he said, sure. So a month later, I was acting head and acting general counsel of that group at the same time. I was his deputy on the litigation side. And then I spent the next year trying to help him find someone from the SEC to take the regulatory enforcement job. And he didn't like the candidates. I helped him interview because I hadn't been in government. I didn't have the SEC experience. And after a year, he just said, this job is yours. You should have the job. He had, and I was, I was a little reluctant because it was, it, I, it had become my comfort zone to a certain extent, but it was outside my real comfort zone. I'd been a litigator for many years. Um, and so I took a deep breath and took a risk. And the dirty little secret is that my job is so much more fun <laughs> than just being a litigator, because I do both. Um, but it is a crisis management job, among other things. Um, you are dealing, you pick up the paper every morning, not just because you're interested in seeing the news, but you're interested in seeing what's being reported about your company, and I work for a financial institution, so unfortunately we're in the news a lot. You're looking at to see what's going on with other financial institutions. You're looking to see what's going on with the SEC and the CFTC and FINRA and Congress and every other regulator you can think of. Um, and it has turned out to be a wonderful move. Ceiling breaking, proud moment. Come I, on, brag ceiling breaking. Um, <laughs> I would, I'm not sure not well. I've I don't know. broken a ceiling. I might be the first woman who's had my position, but it's a I think you are. it's a company with a lot of history and a lot of threads coming up to the top. So proud I might moment? be the, uh, proud moment <laughs> is uh, uh, finding a job that I think for, suits my skills my personality, um, and that I really enjoy, and uh, I think that's my proud moment. Good. Joy. Right ahead. Who Good afternoon. Just, by the way, been named, su what, super lawyer for 2013 and 14 in securities? Best lawyer Best in lawyer. America. Better than super lawyer. Best lawyer. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, like Elise, started out wanting to be a civil rights attorney. Um, I, in my uh, summers at law school, I went first to the ACLU National Prison Project, so there was some foreshadowing that I was going to end up in, in criminal law. Uh, the second summer, I went to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and I think I would have gone to a civil rights job, but they're, they're difficult to get, and I really couldn't find that fit. I also, during law school, worked at the Pr Prison Legal Assistance Project, which I know is still in existence today, PLAP, and I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I told Linda the irony is in that in my first year uh, criminal law section, I was friends with David Brown, who was a Davis Polk lawyer, ironically, but we were first years and we didn't know any of that. And David sat next to me and said, do you know about this organization called the Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C.? It's so righteous, we've just got to do it. <laughs> um, and all, David was also the person who introduced me to PLAP. Um, and so when we graduated, I went to the Public Def Defender Service and he went to Davis Polk. Um, <laughs> um, do you think it was a ploy to get you out of the competition? I, I, I don't know. Props to David, though. I mean, he, he went on to work with Elliot Spitzer when Elliot Spitzer did a lot of good work on Wall Street. So um, he, he did other things as well besides Davis Polk. 
Um, the, I remember David and when he took his earring out and cut his hair before right. he interviewed with law firms. Right, second right, year. right. <laughs> yes, he had a ponytail and an earring at the time he was telling me we needed to be public defenders. Um, so, um, Alan Dershowitz, uh, when I was preparing for meeting you all today, I said to the person who was helping me, I said, I, you know, there's this lore at the law school, and he was not my criminal law professor, that, that Dershowitz says to his students, more of you are probably going to become criminals than criminal defense attorneys. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's the way to start a conversation and get, get people engaged, so to speak. And I said, you know, but I graduated in 1984. That could be my faulty memory. You know, I wasn't in his class. I don't want to say something. So sure enough, um, my paralegal, Alex Zane, who did a great job for me on this, um, Alan Dershowitz was interviewed in the Harvard Law Record September 21st, 2013, and he is indeed saying the same thing. Um, as part of a broader theme of his that he wish, wishes more um, HLS grads would go into public interest law. Anyway, moving to my experience at the Public Defender Service, it, it was a great experience. Um, one of the reasons I went there is um, the training, the trial advocacy training. There's like a six-week program where you're, where you're in your class of um, first years, basically, and there were 12 of us, so it was a small, pretty collegial, intimate group. And you get great training. Um, you know, you learn the skills of uh, examining witnesses, cross-examination, forensic evidence, um, everything from emotions to suppress through trial work and that sort of thing. Um, the other benefit of the Public Defender Service was that your caseloads were limited. They were not overburdened public defenders where they were, you know, had a caseload of 100 and could not do right by their clients. Charles Ogletree, who is now here, was the trial chief at that time, and he was truly an inspirational leader. Um, the um, Ogletree had, I think, 30 acquittals in a row, and uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia threw a party when he lost his first trial. Um, so it was a very exciting time to be there, and I, I truly enjoyed it. Um, at some point, I decided I wanted to move to California, and I had friends in San Francisco who said, you know, find a headhunter. It'll be really easy. There are all kinds of law firms, defense, corporate defense law firms looking for people, and I found a headhunter, and sure enough, they had offers from um, Wilson Sonsini, which I went to, um, Heller Ehrman, which no longer exists, Brobeck, which no longer exists, um, and a small firm named Nossaman. Uh, so I went to Wilson Sonsini because at that time they said they were going to develop a white collar practice and I was uh, paired with a partner who had every intention of doing that but it never really took off. Um, I also didn't feel incredibly uncomfortable, uh, uh, I didn't feel incredibly comfortable at um, what was essentially big law, although it wasn't called big law then. Um, I moved from there, although I, I have to say, we did do a, a great pro bono project for the Pelican Bay State Prison. The chief judge of the Northern District of California, Thelton Henderson, basically buttonholed our litigation chairman at a cocktail party and said, there's some real issues at this prison that I want addressed by a firm that's got a lot of resources, and I want your firm to take it. And so they went looking for somebody who had ever been inside a prison, and I don't mean that, you know, <laughs> as in sentenced, uh, and they found me, and I was one of the first people to go up there and start interviewing uh, prisoners about issues having to do with a lack of medical care, a lack of any kind of psychiatric care, uh, use of excessive force, and, and things of that nature. Uh, that was a long litigation. I was not at Wilson when it was finished. It did go to a bench trial before Judge Henderson, and got a very favorable um, decision that has resulted in a lot of reforms being made at the prison. Um, those reforms, of course, if any of you are familiar at all with prison litigation, have to be monitored because uh, its compliance is not an easy thing to accomplish. Um, at Wilson Sonsini, ironically, I didn't do securities law, I did an intellectual property law. My, my portion of the program will make any of you who you know feel bad about being a dilettante or moving around a lot, better or worse, who knows, you can tell me at the end. Um, 
From there, I decided I wanted to go back to being a public defender, but at this time, at the federal level, um, we had actually paired an associate with the Federal Defender's Office in San Jose to get courtroom experience because that can be a challenge when you're in a um, big defense firm. And at one point, the, the person who was head of that office, David Grunbaum, said to me, I don't think you're real happy there. Uh, we have an opening here. Why don't you come be a PD again? So I, I went and did that and enjoyed it very much. Um, after being a federal defender, that was uh, 92 to 96, I decided to try private firms but in white collar defense. So I went and worked for a white collar defense firm in San Francisco for four years. Um, for a while, I like to say I did everything in four year increments. I mean, I, I guess I had imprinted on the idea from you know high school, college, whatever, that every four years you should do something different. Um, by, by the end of my time doing white collar, which I have to say, and I know this, you know, this is a temperament thing and this is a disposition thing, I didn't really enjoy representing what I would call privileged criminals. I found them much less grateful, um, much more difficult to deal with than uh, street criminals which may come as a surprise to some of you. I also wasn't particularly sympathetic to their excuses for why they did what they did. Um, and again, I wanted to move on. Um, at that point, I had to ask myself, you know, uh, is there anything left for me in criminal law that I want to do? And quite frankly, the answer was no. I considered doing death penalty work and decided that I just couldn't take uh, what it would, would require in terms of the emotional strain, the um, the, the, the cost of knowing that if you don't spot that appellate error, there are very serious consequences. So I um, contacted a friend of mine who had been my opposing counsel. He was an assistant United States attorney named Richard Seaborg, who's now a judge in our district, Northern District of California. And I said, you know, I think I want to uh, explore a plaintiff's firm. And he said, well, I'm having lunch tomorrow with my good friend Jim Finberg, who works at Leaf Cabraser, Hyman and Bernstein, and I'll recommend that he interview you. And so it, it took off th from there and was very serendipitous in a lot of ways. Um, in terms of, of uh, ceiling cracking moments, uh, in my family, as Linda mentioned, I'm the first person to go to college. My mother, who was second in her uh, high school class, was in a family of three. She grew up in the Depression, and her family could not afford to send all of their kids to college, and they picked her older brother, uh, who went on to become an engineer with, with Exxon. Um, she became a secretary. Uh, my older sister, who uh, is actually my half-sister, is 12 years older than I am, and says to this day she did not want to become a nurse, but she was funneled into becoming a nurse by um, my mother in particular, and so I'm the first person in my family to go to college and, and to go to what is a, a non, you know, not a female, a traditional female profession like nursing, secretary, teacher, um, whatever. I, I guess the other, and this feeds into a little bit to the uh, speech at lunch by uh, David Wilkins, is that I was very conscious after the fact, actually, when I became an equity partner at my firm, that the statistics show that about 15% of equity partners are women. And so at some point I said to myself, you know, I guess you've, you know, you've done something here. This is something to be proud of, and I, and I am proud of it. Um, the other thing that nobody likes to talk about, uh, and I, one thing I didn't mention, is when I left Wilson Sonsini and I called my parents to tell them my father was on the phone, and he, and he literally started to cry a little bit. And he said, you're not really going to go back and be a public defender again after all I've spent on your education. And so that was a tough moment, actually, because I, I didn't want to disappoint him. And so when I went into private practice this time at Leaf Cabraser and I, you know, cracked a certain ceiling monetarily, I remember thinking, unfortunately, my dad wasn't alive at the time. He would be proud of this. Um, so, you know, I think women should own up to the fact that you can be proud when you, uh, you know, make money that feels, you know, comparable to what men have made in the past and that women haven't been allowed to make. Um, and the last thing I guess I'll end on is that I'm conscious in the securities field, 
when I go to mediations, when I go to prep sessions for court appearances, when I make court appearances, that I, a lot of the time, can be the only woman who's a partner in the room. Sometimes there will be women associates, but there's a seat at the table, and, and, you're, and you're conscious of the fact that most of the other people in the room are men. Um, and with that, I'll Thanks. turn it over Felicia. to Felicia. Okay. Before I start, I have to give you the standard oh, good. <laughs> SEC disclaimer <laughs> that the SEC and its staff can't be responsible for anything that I'm saying today. And I'm sure that's especially true with respect to my biography. Um, I've devoted most of my career to the securities law, as Linda mentioned, and I wish I could say I took securities regulation in law school and it was kismet, but actually I never took securities regulation. So you could say I've devoted my career to the SEC to make up that credit. <laughs> After I graduated from law school, I clerked for a judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and as a natural outgrowth of that, I decided to go to a large law firm in Chicago, which was Mayor Brown. It's a great law firm, but after I got there, I realized it's really not the right environment for me. Before I went to law school, I had been thinking about a career in public service to begin with. At that time, women were playing a very big role in government. There was like Elizabeth Dole was in the news a lot, and I remember seeing women play a really big role in the Watergate hearings, particularly Elizabeth Holtzman. So that always struck me as an interesting thing to do, was go to Washington and work in public policy. Even back then, getting a job in the federal government was difficult. It's much more difficult now. But even then, it was difficult. So I thought I would just practice applying to federal agencies. There was, at that time, something called a yellow book of federal agencies. So I was planning to go through all the different, the alphabet soup. Since I was in the securities law group, I thought I'd start with the SEC, um, and also the SEC had a good reputation. I was very lucky because the timing was perfect, and they called me out for an interview. That was my first agency. And I remember this because I spent a day and a half in Washington talking to 25 people in four divisions. It's the most I've ever talked in my entire life. <laughs> I remember want needing water, that's <laughs> a day. But um, the people were all uniformly nice. I was really struck by that. And they seemed really interested and energized by the mission of the SEC. So it was an easy decision to go to, to the SEC. I was pretty sure that would be a good place to start. So then I spent four and a half years in what I call my Goldilocks period, because I just kept zipping through divisions trying to find the right fit. <laughs> First, I went to the office of the general counsel and wrote appellate briefs and decided you know, litigation, that, type, that area was not for me. Then I went to Division of Investment Management and reviewed exemptive applications um, that were submitted by investment companies. And then I worked for a commissioner as a legal counsel, and then I landed in Corfin. And that was like the right place for me. I've been, I was there for, I've been here in Corfin for ages and ages, but I ended up in the Office of International Corporate Finance for a very long time, because they gave me really cool assignments. Um, the first one that I really, really enjoyed was um, representing the US government in the OECD steering group on corporate governance. That steering group was started in the late 1990s as a result of the Asian economic crisis, and it met a few times a year in Paris, which is a great gig. And um, we came up with, in 1999, the OECD principles of corporate governance, which we were, were subsequently revised in the mid-2004. But they're uh, considered one of the 12 key principles for financial, international financial stability, and they're still used by the World Bank to assess developing countries. Another assignment that I really enjoyed was to be chair of the disclosure subcommittee of standing, what was called Standing Committee Number One, the International Organization of Securities Commissions, which is responsible, that standing committee was responsible for multinational uh, disclosure and accounting. So my job there was to develop international disclosure projects for the group. M at that time, most um, of the delegations were headed by men. And so when they saw a woman was leading a subcommittee, they put all their female delegates on that subcommittee, because I think they thought we'd all bond. But we came up with some very interesting and important projects, like disclosure principles <laughs> for cross-border offerings and listings of debt and things like that. So after four, so then about four and a half years ago, I was uh, selected to be chief of the Office of Rulemaking, which is the office that implements rules that affect domestic issuers. And we've been very busy, as Linda mentioned, implementing Dodd-Frank and the Jobs Act. So we did like say on pay the notorious conflict minerals rule, and then the pay ratio disclosure, which was recently proposed. Um, 
I realize looking back on my career at this point that apparently I'm quite bossy because I like setting up standards and rules for others. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of something to be proud. <laughs> In terms of a glass ceiling, as you can see from this panel, I didn't have that much of a glass ceiling to break because like Linda was the first female um, director of enforcement, which is a really big deal. That's almost, I always think that is almost an all-male division, but I think there are now women playing more prominent roles. There are some who are associate directors, but that still was quite, a, um, quite an achievement. And, a, and of course, Elise was chair and commissioner, and although there have been women chairmen and commissioners, there are not that many. So. In terms of glass ceiling, I think my main contribution has been in terms of this job being selected as a chief of the office of rulemaking. Um, while there have been many women in leadership positions, there haven't been that many people from diverse ethnic or, or racial backgrounds, especially in a re relatively visible role. So I think that's my main contribution. And I think that's slowly but surely changing at the SEC. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of where we all came from. It's a, it's a little sort of cobbled together, and I think one of the things we all have learned over time is serendipity, you know, take advantage of the things that come your way, and um, who knows where they'll end up. But now I thought we would, could dive in a little to see whether or not there's anything to the notion that securities law is actually a field that is quite friendly to women. Uh, I personally think it is, in part because there's such synergy between the public sector and the private sector in the practice of securities law, and your public sector credentials are somewhat unassailable uh, when people are trying to figure out what to do and who to hire on the private side. But it's something I think we can explore. I know it's something Elaine can talk to. But before we get, get to Elaine on that, I wanted to start, Elise, with you. You mentioned when you talked about it that um, there are, and it's been alluded to, there are parts of the securities field, in, even in the public sector, that are very friendly to women and parts that have been less so, and you've seen it for a long time, and I don't know if you had any views on you know, what's happened and where it's friendlier and why. Uh, there are some people who cynically think, historically, uh, the government jobs that have been the most friendly for women have been the ones that have been less visible because uh, women get hired for things p other people don't want to do, and then they do a very good job, and their next job is fantastic because they have done extraordinarily well at something that someone really didn't care about until they saw how well it could be done. I don't know that that was ever true um, in the securities law field. It definitely was true in the, in the related futures field. Um, about, way back when, before there was such a thing as financial futures, women were steered into those jobs the same way they were steered into being uh, states and trusts lawyers. Uh, and I don't know how many of you took a states and trusts in law school. Uh, I did not take it, not because I wasn't interested, but because I wanted to be sure I wasn't qualified to be in a states <laughs> and trusts um, and, and that was the rumor. And that, the same thing was true with respect to, uh, with respect to futures. So if you look at the cohort of, of people kind of my age and a little bit younger who practice in the futures arena, many of them are women because they were agricultural products and they got stuck into the back room with the agricultural products. Lo and behold, in the early 80s, financial futures arrived and who had the expertise but all of these women. So for a long time, the senior women uh, lawyers in futures, private sector, uh, in-house, um, and, um, and in the government, um, uh, there were many, many women. I think it was less true in the securities laws. Um, it, uh, to me, what it appeared to be when I first got to the commission back in the, in the late 70s was really more sort of a cultural or persona sort of thing. Linda's division. Um, was viewed as uh, we're the enforcers, we're macho. It's kind of like know. U.S. attorneys. There right, were a lot right. of suspenders. So was, right. Yeah. A lot of the, yeah. The, the, uh, braces, please. Oh, they were. They me. had to be called braces too. And um, and there were there were very very few senior women. That started to change. Um, as Felicia said, uh, Linda, Linda has the honor, or perhaps maybe not the honor, of being the I first like female it. director. Uh, and I like having you like it. <laughs> um, at, there were other senior women before then. The Division of Market Regulation, now known as Trading and Markets, had the reputation, I, I don't know if they did internally, but in other parts of the commission, for being kind of like a softball team. Not good enough to be a baseball team because the enforcement people could be the baseball team, but a softball team and not a softball team that was co-ed. 
uh, and you sort of you played with the softball team, and you uh, there were a lot of runners in the division uh, of of market regulation, and none of them were women. Eventually, that changed, but it was much slower, and some of it had to do with the people who were involved. I when I interviewed in the general counsel's office, I interviewed with a woman among others, who was the, an associate general counsel at the time. His name is Kathy McGrath. And Kathy, who is awesome, um, uh, later went on uh, to, in fact, by the time I got there, she had gone on to trading and markets to be, a senior, to be a senior person. She left the commission. She came back as the head of investment management. She was a strong, competent, no-nonsense, really fun woman. And she made a very, very big difference. So I, I think it, it more had to do with culture and sort of who ended up um, in, in, in what kinds of positions. But it had real lingering effects. Uh, and there really is, as we all know, I think it's, it's, it's more than simply try to say that people like to hire people who are kind of like them. And if, you, if, if you're not represented to begin with, it becomes harder to crack the barrier and to have, and to have people represented. Um, and it was interesting. When I went from the CFTC to NASD, which later became FINRA, uh, when Mary Shapiro um, left the government to, uh, to head and reinvigorate their regulatory program, there were a lot of jokes about how we were moving from being a golf culture because a lot of business got done on the golf course at board meetings to being a jewelry culture, which personally I found, <laughs> I, I found much better. But people abruptly stood up to take notice because they didn't know what to do with the concept that here were a whole bunch of people who weren't in, intra, terribly interested in what were more traditionally male sort of aspects of having an important job. Um, and it took a while for people to get used to that. Yeah, I think it, it, you, you can correct me if you want. My sense is the commission is that the Division of Investment Management uh, has always been female friendly because it has had numerous heads of that division who were women going back mm -hmm. decades. Uh, and the Division of Corporation Finance, fewer female heads, but though I think Linda was the first. Uh, Linda Quinn was the first iconic, beloved, and she died relatively young, and I think her, Im her impact on that division has made it sort of female friendly for a long time. Uh, and we'll see what, what kind of lasting impact what the Division of Enforcement had, but it, 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 it's, it's a little bit more of a, uh, an old boys network. Um, Elaine, when we were getting prepped, we talked about um, something that I found fascinating. And Elaine is a consumer of legal services. Be very nice to Elaine. She may hire you tomorrow. Uh, and she noted that in some, when she's looking for counsel, uh, I think she's pretty conscious of you know, gender and other issues. And there are some areas where she's looking where it's easy to identify uh, women who can do the job and in other areas where it's more difficult. And I wondered if you could talk about that. So uh, both in engaging counsel and also I'm on the uh, executive committee of the SIPMA, Securities Industry Finance Markets Association, Compliance and Legal Committee. And we do a big conference every year. It's really like 1,700 cool people. And um, hopefully I'll get a lot of speakers today. <laughs> um, and uh, when we're putting together the enforcement panels, the um, regulation panels, there are a lot of women to choose from. And when we're putting together the civil litigation panels, I find it harder. There are some wonderful female civil litigators, but um, I feel that the headline names um, tend to be more male than in securities enforcement. Obviously, Linda is a headline name, and not only if you hire her will she do a wonderful job, but the CEO of my company could hardly complain when I hire the distinguished Linda Thompson, who was the first female head of enforcement. So um, when you work for a big corporation, you're both seeking out the best talent, but to be blunt, you're also seeking out someone who has demonstrated expertise in the, in the field so that um, if things don't go 100% right, you can say, I hired the best. You know, let's tell the traders not to do that next time instead of playing the <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> and, you know, there are a number of other people, um, you know, I could start listing them, um, but, but I won't, who were very senior people in the SEC and in FINRA um, who I um, can choose from. And I love hiring, as Linda said, 
women when I can. And I think, you know, part of it may be the government credential, and we spoke about this, that it's an unassailable credential, and so you come into a law firm um, with um, an expertise um, and recognition, and you are, you know, you're really a senior person right away. Part of it might be the personality traits that draw you to certain types of roles. Um, I think when you are dealing with regulators, and we have lots and lots of them, um, we are facing the same regulators over and over again. And so um, I could get all aggressive, and I could, you know, uh, really um, embarrass them in certain cases and win. Um, but you know what? They'll remember, um, and they'll remember the next time. And so it is a constant. Um, exercise of persuasion and advocacy. And you don't want to stomp your foot the loudest. Um, you want to be the most persuasive. And I think those are skills that um, women are uh, you know, noted for. Uh, I'll just say it. I'm sorry if I'm drawing distinctions. But women um, have been, um, are persuasive and careful and thoughtful and good advocates, and they don't necessarily need to kick up the most fuss to do it. Well, and the other thing is we talked <laughs> about is when sometimes, uh, and this is this is changing. Early in my career, I could kick up a lot of fuss and be really, really obnoxious, um, but my audience just assumed that they, they so underestimated me that it wasn't that, that it, it didn't matter. Um, judges were always, I could get sidebars nobody else could do because they thought they were helping me. You know, let's help the little lady. I, I, once, had, I once had a witness, honest to goodness, say to me, say to the whole world, I was horrified, do I have to answer the little lady's question? And the judge, God love him, said yes. And, and it actually it worked to my advantage, uh, except for that momentary period of acute embarrassment. Um, but I, I think we're underestimated uh, less often, which is kind of too bad because I thought it was a great tool. Uh, Joy, you had some similar experiences um, in terms of becoming uh, lead counsel mm -hmm. and the issues associated with that in the securities field. I wonder if you could address that. Sure. Um, in 1995, something called the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act was passed, and it kind of changed how uh, the leadership on the plaintiff side of cases is is done. Um, you take the you know the investor with the largest loss um, to lead the to lead the class action on the plaintiff side, and that fund or plaintiff picks their counsel as lead counsel. And what I did in preparing for this today is I went back and I looked at the largest settlements in the last ten years, cases like Enron, Linda. We'll have some familiarity with that. I do. Um, Enron, McKesson, WorldCom, Ascendant, cases that made the news. And then I looked at who was leading those cases on the plaintiff's side, you know, just looking at the captions and the orders and people's roles in the cases. And unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that the first name in the caption, none of, none of them were women. It's very common to find second and third names be women. And in my experience, I can tell you that's frequently the role I've been playing at my firm to one of the named partners, Richard Hyman. Um, so, you know, there's, there's room for improvement, certainly. Um, I think at my firm, I'm, I'm grateful that one of our, the founding partner of our firm, uh, Elizabeth Cabraser, who founded it with, with Robert Leaf, um, has had leadership roles throughout the firm's existence from the early 1970s. And so that's made our firm a little different in terms of how female friendly it is and for seeing role models in leadership positions. Um, similarly, Kelly Dermody, who's an employment and consumer lawyer, um, has been on the executive committee for a very long time and has, has given me a lot of opportunities that I'm, that I'm very thankful for. Um, but yes, you still see that, that phenomenon of when somebody wants to hire you know, the person who's going to kick ass as a trial lawyer, they don't automatically think of a woman. Um, and, so, and so the fact that it's securities law, what takes over is the fact that it's litigation. Yeah. And, and yeah. So who, who can be the toughest, who can be the... Right. The, I have a funny counterpoint oh, to good. your little lady story. Oh, good. When, when I was a public defender and I, I was in court one day and I was really making headway, cross-examining, uh, I was a police officer, a detective, I can't remember which, and at one point he said, yes, sir, that's right, sir. 
And I thought, <laughs> okay, all right, we're we're cooking with gas now. <laughs> Well done. I would take that as an enormous compliment. Oh, sir. Oh, right. <laughs> All, hmm? Is there a question? <laughs> um, Felicia, do you have a sense of how being in the public sector sort of advances your career? I mean, compare yourself to your colleagues who haven't, haven't been in the public sector or some of the people who come into the public sector uh, late in their career, and how, how does that compare and contrast in terms of your ability as a lawyer, uh, your expertise, and your confidence? In the government, one thing I noticed is that you can have a significant impact much earlier in your career. Um, for example, when I did the OECD project, that was actually an important project for um, many companies because those kind of corporate governance international standards, they sound theoretical, but they could carry over and um, have a negative perception effect on certain companies. So in that project, there were several senior Wall Street partners who were trying to influence the project. But the thing is, no matter what, they, couldn't, they didn't have a seat at the table. It was the US Treasury and SEC delegation did. And we were about half their age, half their ages. So, at an early, I think at an earlier stage you take on, you have more responsibility and even when you just first start at the commission, you're, you're reviewing and commenting on registration statements for major IPOs, you're influencing what people do with their deals. Um, you, I think you take a role in enforcement matters early on. Um, you can draft the rulemaking releases so you're playing a significant role in public policy early on. And then beyond that, there's this wonderful sense of mission at the commission which unifies people. There's a, it's a wonderful environment to work in and I think people flourish. There's a sense of teamwork. For instance, the commission recently proposed um, rules on pay racial disclosure. It was led by my office, but we had a lot of input from economists in the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis. So when you have that shared mission, it's just, it makes the project more fun, which helps in, the, in sort of enjoying your work. And last but not least, there have been all these women relatively speaking, who have been playing leadership roles in the SEC. So you have all these wonderful role models. You realize you don't have to act like a man to be successful. And that makes a huge difference. It changes the ambiance. I remember when I was at the law firm, it felt very masculine to me. But especially in corporation finance, there have been so many women in leadership positions. Um, it gives you more confidence that you can just, that you can flourish and have a successful career. Um, I checked to see, just number, numbers-wise, uh, where the SEC stands. According to um, statistics for 2012, approximately 31% of the lawyers in the U.S. are women. At the SEC, 42% of the lawyers are women. In terms of management ranks, uh, the branch chief and assistant director level, about 39% of the management um, is made up of women. Uh, if you include the most senior management, which would be like directors and associate directors, that's the most elite cadre, then it's still like 35% of the women are in, manage, um, are in ma the management positions. As a whole in the federal government, um, women make up about 47% of the lawyers. So there are more opportunities. There's more of a tradition of women playing leadership roles. So as a woman, especially starting your career in the government, um, it just you get to deal with very difficult issues that you might not otherwise have if you're in the private sector and you're playing more of a junior role because um, just with the mentoring, you have more access to mentoring, more access to a network. Yeah, I thought we could spend a little bit of time. I'm always, when I look back at what people want to do when, when they're young lawyers, certainly in New York, uh, people who call themselves litigators, young associates, the thing they want to do is work for the Southern District of New York. It's sort of like they want to go fly jets. Um, and, um, and yet, when I think about what kind of, and most of them don't want to spend their careers at the Southern District of New York. Uh, they want to spend some time there, but they anticipate going back into private practice at some point, if for no other reason than they also anticipate having families and mortgages and tuition and things like that to do, and they figure the private sector is a better place to get themselves positioned for that. Um, it doesn't translate as well, at least in my mind, to uh, private practice than, say, being in the securities field. And I don't know if others have a view of that. Uh, it certainly seems to me that you have 
a credential that translates more uh, for more work in the uh, in the private sector. I mean, because if you if you're well off to be an assistant United States attorney, maybe you get to do white collar criminal work, maybe. But you'll spend a lot of time doing drug cases, theft cases, the kinds of things that don't necessarily translate. I don't know if others have views on that one way or the other. Well, I do think it's true that most people who are prominent in the securities bar um, across the board have spent some time at the commission. Uh, and there are a couple people who did not. And usually if you spend, and they're very prominent, very capable, very intelligent people, and if you spend more than an hour with them, you'll know that because they'll tell you. It's like an apology. <laughs> well, I didn't work at the commission because it seems to be something you are supposed to do. Now, part of that has to do with the field, I think. Part of it has to do with the mission because Felicia's right. There is a very intense commitment to people, people to, the, to the mission. And, um, every year um, there is a gathering of the Association of SEC alum, alumni, uh, an award ceremony. It happens around the same time as an SEC-wide You're conference. You're looking at an honoree. <laughs> um, and there are hundreds, uh, it's probably well over a thousand people show up to the, to the cocktail hour, right. um, maybe 1,500 at the cocktail hour or more, um, to see everyone they've missed over the past year. It really is a club that you want to belong to. And I'm not sure that's true at every federal agency, but it certainly is true at the commission. Yeah. I have to jump in here because okay. I am actually at the Southern District of New York. I'm an <laughs> there you go. Um, I have been there six and a half years, and the last nearly four years spent in the securities unit. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to actually add to your question is that it's interesting thing about the Southern District of New York is that you meet a lot of young people who want to come to the U.S. Securities Office. But an interesting st statistic from a couple of years ago, and I say a couple years ago, was that only about a third of the applicants to the U.S. Attorney's Office were women. And I actually found that a, tremending, a tremendously troubling statistic to me because a lot of the, the pool from, from which we hire are actually pretty young young people. Um, I actually did things a little backwards. I'm Antonia Adson, class of 94. Oh, thank you. But, um, <laughs> but, but so, you know, there are sort of people who have clerked, maybe spent a few years in law school. So they're only five to ten years out. And yet self-selecting out already that only a third of the only a third of the applicants are women, and, and in fact, about a third of the hires in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Southern District of North Carolina are women, which is what the question should be asked. Well, it's I, good I that it's that good that. Really it's troubling statistic, and I don't know why that is. I don't know why you, you folks mentor younger people. Uh, I, I, I just, I don't know why that is. Well, we have, we, uh, yes, ma'am. And I'm Barbara Lee from the class of 1962, and I was an SEC, SEC staff attorney from 62 to 66. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. And, Loss, I have to say. He was, he was my first professor. Yeah, he was very, anyway, then I was a magistrate judge in the Southern District of New York from 88 to 96. And I really wanted to comment on the point about transferability of skills. Because I certainly found at a time in the 1960s when the government was the only equal opportunity employer, I found that when I left the SEC after four years, I had a marketable skill and I didn't get the silly questions about are you going to leave us and get married. But as far as the U.S. Attorney's Office is concerned, and this is also true of the Public Defender's Office in the Southern District of New York, those are the best litigators I have ever encountered in my career. And believe me, that is a transferable skill, whether you're representing uh, drug kingpins or Smith Barney or, uh, you know. No, I, I, I have to agree. I, actually, one of the things that recently, as you undoubtedly have seen, um, one of the sad things for U.S. Attorney's offices is, is that because of the sentencing guidelines and other things, and even though the sentencing guidelines are no longer mandatory, you see fewer trials so that people get fewer opportunities to, to practice that. I'd like to return to the issue of who, it's the self-selection and applications. And if there's anything we can all take away from this is, in, is the continue, to continue to encourage people to apply. Because it's one thing to, if there's bias in the selection process, uh, some of us can and have addressed it. But if people don't apply, it's sort of like, I don't know how many kids I talk to who say, I'm not going to apply to Harvard because I'm not going to get in. To which I say, well, if you don't apply, I guarantee you won't get in. The other troubling thing about that statistic is that, you know, 
we select a lot of people who are elected. If you look at the numbers on courts, the judges are actually hiring 50% women too. So it, there's a drop off somewhere, you know, not long after law school when they don't apply. Now, you, you mentioned enforcement, you know, maybe it's perceived that the litigation of being a trial, I mean, I don't know, Joy, if you're, you, you mentioned you're the only woman, maybe the perception is that litigation is something that's more difficult or more, I, I, for women, I, I don't know, because I'm in the midst of it and love it, but, but uh, I, I just, I find that do you think that's as specific as to change. Do you think it has anything to do with the time, that the fact that you're relatively young when you go into the U.S. Attorney's Office and so you're going to be in your late 20s, let's say, or 30, and that's when you're supposed to be having kids? I, I know, I should, with the caveat that I did things a little backwards, I actually went in quite late mm -hmm. uh, in my career. Um, I actually am not so sure about that because actually the U.S. Attorney's Office is probably far more friendly to having kids than in the private sector, notwithstanding all of the great firms have maternity to leave. There's, there's, there's little penalties along the way, whereas I think there's less of a penalty actually in the U.S. Attorney's Office for having kids and having maternity to leave. So I'm not sure that's the answer. The, the, I'm spec, out of sheer speculation, and, and again, I don't want to focus too much time on the attorney's office here, but um, I think that an important uh, uh, sort of factor for, for kids, if I can say, to figuring out whether to join the U.S. attorney's office is, is whether or not they work for somebody else who was formerly in the U.S. attorney's office, both because those senior people can describe their experience, and if you ever speak to an alum, they think it's the best job they've ever had. Right. Um, and, and also because that helps with the application process. So people who have access to that um, are more likely to apply. That's a that, sheer guesswork on my part. And of course, there are less women. It's historically, there have been less women um, uh, through the U.S. Attorney's Office. And therefore, if, if mentoring relationships are gender-based, I'm not sure if that's true. But if they are, then maybe that may be one, uh, one explanation. I don't know. I'm scratching my head. I don't. It is a little curious that the other thing. Yes, ma'am. I was going to just um, follow up on Elaine's comment. So I'm class of 2005. I think it is interesting given the time in your life because while private practice may or may not be conducive to having kids, if you've been there quite a few years and have like a network of supporters, you do go out on leave. Um, you have people who support you when you come back. Whereas it's an awkward time, I would think. That's just, you know, if you were committed to having a family at a certain point in time to leave because you have to build up credibility. If you want to keep succeeding, you have to build up credibility at the next place you go, I think, before you then have kids and you know leave for a while. So I don't think you would like leave somewhere and have kids right away. You know, so it's a comfort about being at a firm or a group of people who support you. That's certainly true. Are there more questions? Because we're, get, we're getting close. Yes. Oh, we've got five minutes. That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes. I have a question, which is, um, I, I guess I'm listening to you with great interest because you're the path not chosen. I took classes from Louis Loss and I just loved it, but I went to tax instead of securities. But um, I also, though, I had absolutely zilch interest in being a litigator. No, no. Don't want to be inside a courtroom. Do you, I mean, but you guys all sound like you've got a litigation background. Is that the only way to succeed in, in the SEC field? No. No. Uh, and, uh, and on that, on that sort of litigation front. Um, when I graduated from here and people would say, what, what do you want to do? Um, I said, I really don't know. I mean, I came from a family of engineers. Uh, I knew nothing about the law. Uh, and I, I, I knew a little bit more when I got through school, but not that much. Um, but I said, but I know one thing. I know I will never, ever litigate. Uh, because to me, a litigator was Perry Mason, and I didn't look <laughs> like him, I didn't sound like him, I couldn't do any of that stuff. And of course, I then went to a firm which blessedly at that time had a rotation system, uh, or an unassigned program, and being the good girl that I was, I said, oh, I better do some litigation because it's, it's probably good for me, and then I'll know I'll hate it. Um, and I loved it, and then I, I went to a U.S. Attorney's Office, and so I did that litigation route. That is probably the route to enforcement work at the SEC, uh, at either through a firm or through a public defender's office or a prosecutor's office. That is typically the way litigators, get, that's how you get to enforcement on any side. But the rest of the commission actually hates litigators and, and thinks they're idiots because they don't know the securities law. The, rest, the whole rest of the place, which is four-fifths of it, is substantive law. I mean, if I were to describe myself as a securities lawyer, um, four-fifths of the people at the commission would recoil in horror, because what I know is 10 be 5 um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, at Isn't least. that all you need to know? Well, I, yes. I, I agree, exactly. with, the, the, I agree with the basic <laughs> premise um, that, you, that you don't have to be a litigator. And in fact, one thing that is true is I, I had a tiny bit of litigation experience once I got to the commission. The appellate work I did for years doesn't count. That's not viewed as being a litigator. No, oh my no, God, no. no, that has nothing to do with being a litigator. Um, but it, it is not a required background at all. And most people are dealing with, in things that are far more arcane um, than, than 10b-5, although Linda knows those too. <laughs> Ellen. I'm in the class of 77, and through my career, I've done a lot of work with the SEC, not exclusively, but a lot. And I just wanted to say that one of the things I've always appreciated about the agency, and maybe have made it a congenial, a congenial field for women, is that, is that I've never encountered anything but scrupulous, you know, I've never encountered any, any condescension, any suggestion that my um, arguments weren't being taken on the merits, you know, maybe I didn't always win, win them, but, but um, that, that it was a completely meritocratic experience. And I, I really, I don't know what you guys did on the inside, but that's how, it, that's how it works on the outside, and I think it's just a wonderful thing. I think we inherited a, a culture, thanks to people like Louis Loss, uh, and you know, however, however that happened, people valued it and protected it. At least that was my experience. You had you had a question. Oh sure, yeah. I'm curious uh, for those of you who are now in in firms or in the private sector about what how the perception of the SEC from the outside is changing now that the statute of limitations is, has run pretty much in most of the financial crisis cases, and now the SEC's direction is shifting a little bit uh, with a new second term of the Obama administration, perhaps a new focus on different sorts of enforcement actions, full disclosure, actually work on enforcement of the SEC. But I'm curious to know what sort of the outside view of the SEC is now that you're five years post the, the crash. Wayne, you're an outsider. I am an outsider. Um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, trepidation. Um, the SEC, I, I will say that, um, you know, and don't tell anyone back in enforcement, <laughs> but um, we deal with a lot of regulators, and generally the feeling is that the SEC is trying to get it right, that they're trying to reach a reasonable resolution, that they're trying to understand what the issues are, um, and that they're trying to be proportionate to the behavior. And so, um, that is true. You don't feel that you're not getting a reasonable hearing on your issues. Um, there's a little bit of trepidation over this new neither admit nor deny and how it's being applied. And um, uh, you know, I know when Mary Jo White first gave her speech, um, it was it'll only be applied in very specific, rare. unusual, rare circumstances. It doesn't appear to us to be that rare. Uh, and I think that we probably will, as an industry, be able to reach a place where firms will still believe that it's in their best interest to appropriately resolve matters when they should be resolved and not litigated, um, and um, that uh, without um, buying um, inappropriate and um, un uh, without buying inappropriate um, civil litigation <laughs> from people <laughs> like Joy. So I think that um, we will be able to get to a place where we can still save the U.S. taxpayers money and appropriately resolve matters that the SEC might not win a trial, but that firms want to put this behind them. But I think that's the one of the big concerns facing the industry today. And with that, look to the future. Uh, I, the, the red flag that says that we're over has come up. So uh, it's been lots of fun. Uh, thank you all. And we will all probably be, I think someone's coming here, so we may head out into the hall. Thank you all. Thank you.